so we're continuing in the Sermon on the Mount and getting close to the end of a chapter. And not just, I mean, a chapter in your Bibles, but a chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. It almost comes in three chapters. There's lots of groups of three in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, if you want to read through it, try and look for those groups because finding those groups actually helps you understand what point Jesus is trying to get out in each of those stories. I titled this morning... Uh, a story of faux pas, fashion, and fascist regimes. Three Fs. Okay? Um, So let's pray. Father, here we are this morning to gather together as your people. Uh, We have come from different backgrounds. Uh, We've come from different towns. We've come from different weeks. And Father, we have different ideas in our brains, I'm sure. Father, I pray that you would help us to see you today, to be uh, understanding more of the character of God, the one we claim as our King, and Father, that we might represent you uh, truthfully and honestly in such a way that people will look at us and not see a, a bad representation of our God, but we'll see who you are. And I pray this in your holy name. Amen. So you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So where had the people heard this said? There are a couple of places where it pops up. It pops up uh, in Exodus chapter 21. And it also pops up in Leviticus chapter 24. I'm going to read from Leviticus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 21 talks about if you hit a pregnant woman... um, And then goes on about this. Leviticus is a bit more broad. So I'm just going to read from Leviticus chapter 24, verse 19, which says, If anyone injures his neighbour, whatever he has done must be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has injured the other, so he is to be injured. Whoever kills an animal must make restitution but whoever kills a man must be put to death. You are to have the same law for the alien and the native born. I am the Lord your God. So when Jesus says, you have heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, he's actually quoting the Torah. So the Torah being the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, These are the scriptures that uh, everyone hung on to dearly. The, the, the Torah means the law. It's not all law, but the law is in there. Okay, and one of the laws is this law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, when I think of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the first thing I think of is retaliation, of getting my own back, of you've done this to me, now I need to get this back from you. And it's funny, when we start to discuss these things, we talk about this in Bible study, and, and the first thing is it's about justice, about justice for me that something has happened to me which has really done me wrong and I want justice and what justice means is that I get what is due to me because of what you have done to me now the law of justice that comes from this bible is actually a a limiting law it's not one that says you must Take out the eye. In fact, when I read just then, it actually said you must. But the idea is that that's where it stops. We've heard all about the mafias, you know, and and the the, the big gangs and stuff. And when something's done to them, they retaliate. But how do they retaliate? Is it eye for eye? Oh, gee, you took out a leader, we'll take out your leader. No, it usually escalates, doesn't it? Has anyone seen Monty Python? Has anyone seen the fish slap? It is bizarre. Like I was listening to, a, to one of the guys talk about today. In Monty Python, there's a skit where it's called the fish slap dance. And there's a guy, two, two guys dressed up in, suit, in like safari outfits. And one guy's got two little fish. And he goes up and he dances up and he slaps the guy across the face and he comes back. And he comes across and he slaps the guy across the face and he comes back. He does this four times, just slapping a guy across the face with a fish. Two fish, two little fish, two little pill jars, whatever they are. And then he comes back to his spot and he stops. And the other guy pulls out his fish, <laughs> smack, and wipes him out. That's retaliation. Okay, you've injured me, you, you've 
upset me, you've done something wrong to me, I'm going to get mine back. But I'm not just going to get mine back, I'm going to get justice. I'm going to get justice how I see it, no matter what the consequence. Of course, what happens next? Well, not in the skit, the skit ends there, that's about it. But in real life, you've now injured me more than I injured you, so what am I going to do? I'm going to retaliate, I'm going to pick out a bigger fish, you know, whatever it might be. So the law of the, of the, the Torah is actually one that limits this. It says, I know the hearts of human beings. You don't know justice from a, from a duck in the street. I'm going to limit it. So when something happens to you, you can only get back what is due to you. And in fact, a lot of the time in, in Israel history, they didn't actually take out the eye of one person if you lost an eye. There would be a monetary value assigned to it, which is not dissimilar to today. Okay, when you're wronged, um, you stand before the judge and the judge hands out a penalty that is in somewhat similar to whatever the crime you did, hopefully. But that is justice. That is justice. So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say to you, you have heard it said, do not resist an evil person. You have heard it said, turn the other cheek. You have heard it said, if someone takes your tunic, your shirt, give them your cloak as well. And I'll tell you what, this this rings back, I've just been meditating over the verse 16 of chapter 5. Verse 16, which says, which talks about being the light of the world. And verse 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And at first light, we look at this and we go, okay, someone smacks me across the cheek, I give them the other cheek. In some ways, that makes me feel a little bit better. I don't get justice, but you know, it's a bit like, uh, there's my light shining. I've done a good thing, haven't I? And hopefully the other person gets to see a bit of God in me because I didn't retaliate. Someone sues me for my shirt. So if someone's suing you, you, you've done something wrong. This is that eye for an eye, that tooth for a tooth, that that lawful thing, isn't it? That uh, you've done something wrong and now I'm getting my justice back by taking from you what is due to me. The the tunic must be worth whatever the crime was, so I'm going to take that from you. And if if I'm willing to hand over more than is asked of me, then I'm surely, I'm I'm doing something good here. I'm showing the goodness of God to somebody. My light is shining in the hope that someone will see God and praise him because I gave you my cloak as well as my shirt. And then in the third one, it's a, a bit of a thing that would happen with the Romans. They had a rule that the Romans were allowed to lumber all the gear on top of you and get you to carry it for a mile. And only for a mile. Uh, And then you could say at the end of it, oh, you know, I'm going to show how God has changed me so much. I'm going to go the extra mile with you and I'm going to carry your gear. Probably grumbling all the way. Why am I doing this? You know, but um, anyway, God will bless me for it because I'm letting my light shine. And in some ways, yes, that all makes sense. In some ways, you are letting your light shine. You are doing something different. You're you're stepping out of your comfort zone and you're doing something which which actually is all about you. It's all about you making an attempt to do something that will honour God. It's you um, giving up your rights. It's you. And so much in the conversations when we talk about this sort of stuff, it's, it's... I, I, how good am I? I? I'm giving up my right to justice. I'm giving up my right to what is due to me um, because God will bless me. And maybe someone else will get to see what's going on. But I think if you leave it there, it can be quite damaging. I don't know if this is why. I, I'm a, I hate conflict. I will avoid conflict like the plague. Not that I've ever had to avoid the plague. I I will avoid conflict like a council worker will avoid work. (laughs) I used to be a council worker, I'm allowed to say that. 
But I, I don't like conflict. And so I've almost used this as an excuse for my whole life. That when someone does me wrong, I will just do nothing. I won't let it bother me. I'll step back and I'll let them run all over the top of me. Because well, Jesus said it's the thing to do. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Jesus said, walk the extra mile. Jesus said, hand over more than is asked of you. And, and I take comfort in that. You know, I'm, God, I'm doing the right thing. Good on me. I'm doing what you've asked me to do. And will it affect the other person? Well, most of the time I'm actually enabling the other person. Because I have made no difference to them uh, someone who wants to smack me across the face, I've made no difference to them if I don't hit them back. In fact, you know, maybe they will question it. Why did you not hit me back? Maybe they'll just think I'm weak. Problem is, so if we leave these three examples where they are now, which is way the, way, the way I've always left them, I think you're going to miss... The actual point of what Jesus is talking about. He is not telling you to be weak. He's not telling you to lay down and play dead. In fact, the way it was always put to me is, you know, if someone does something wrong to you, don't do anything back. Don't stoop down to their level. You are better than that. You are better than them. But is that what Jesus is telling us as followers of him? That we are better than other people? I've never heard Jesus say that. In fact, everything we've read now through Matthew, through the Sermon on the Mount, helps me to, to realise that I'm actually on the same level as everybody else. I'm just as guilty of disobeying God as everyone else. My heart is as filthy as everyone else's. I am no better than anybody else. So how do I respond? And what's Jesus saying here? What's he talking about? Play dead. We've talked about putting things in context. I also want to put things in culture. And once we are start to understand the culture of Jesus' time, you'll realise that what you think he said, he hasn't said. So now I need Gary to come up and slap me. <laughs> so Gary, we've just read the passage. Yeah. Do you need me to read it again? No, oh, no, I, I think I've got okay. it. Okay. Yeah. As the passage says, slap me. All right. Yeah, on the head or just As you know. the passage says, slap me. Okay. Was it the right cheek or the left cheek? <laughs> okay. So, did he do it right? He what does the passage stands. say? What's the passage say? You have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I tell you, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, what do you do? Oh, you on the left. No. Oh. If yeah. someone strikes you on the right cheek, he just hit me on the left. So try oh. again. All right. <laughs> How's that? Okay. Did he do it right? Yeah. Well, actually, no. Right. Think about the culture of the day. Toilet paper was invented in about 600, uh, six, 600 AD. Oh, I hit you with my dirty hand. You did. Bad, Gary. So what you have just done is admitted that what you're doing is a bad thing. Oh. Because you've, you've just hit me with the unclean hand. You. <laughs> <laughs> Much better. <laughs> See, understanding the culture of the time helps you understand what's going on. People in that time of, the, uh, time of the season would not use their left hand for anything other than what is unclean. I had a mate. I had a mate who um, went to Afghanistan. And uh, when the conflict first started out and there was refugee camps, he went as a missionary and one of the things he, he, he couldn't do, he was struggled is that getting used to, well, I washed my bottom with my left hand because there's no TP. And so, yeah, that was just so hard for him. Near impossible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mark difference. 
So shake hands, just the correct way of doing things. Yeah. Remember, you just did it, so do yeah. it again. Okay. Yes, two. Okay. If you strike someone with the back of the hand, what am I intending to do? Uh, My, insult. Sorry. It's an insult. It's, an insult. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about punching. Yeah. It's and not I'll about hurting. Good. I'll be good to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> Deal with you later. Yeah. Okay, so it says quite clearly, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. The right cheek in a right handed culture would be a backhanded slap. And as you said, Sue, it's not really about hurting the person. If I hurt the person, I'll just close my fist and lay into you, would I not? It's an insult. In fact, it is the biggest insult. It is an insult in this time and day. It is an insult that says, you are below me. You are nothing to me. In fact, in the culture, if you were a slave, you would much prefer you would get smacked across the back with a rod than for your master to slap you across the face with the back of the hand. It is a demeaning thing to do. And in that day and age, if you were of equal standing, it wasn't a slave versus master, it was just two masters or two slaves or whatever it might be, to be slapped across the face with the back of the hand, not the front of the hand, was actually a, an illegal thing to do. And you could be fined for it. You could be fine more than if I punched you in the face. Because to punch in the face is a physical thing which creates pain, but to slap with the back of your hand is actually demeaning. It is bringing you down. It is taking your value away. And so when Jesus says, when someone slaps you across the right cheek, turn to them the left. See, the culture is that if I use the back of my hand for anything, it's bringing you down. If I use the front of my hand for anything, it's calling you on the same level. It's actually saying to you, you're my equal. I still want to beat you up. I still want to create pain. I still want to, to I'm still cranky. But to use the front of the hand actually brings you into that evenness. You are of the same calibre as me. So if I'm slapped across the right cheek with the back of the hand, I have two options. Jesus says, do not resist the evil one. Let's go into that word of resist for a minute. What does that word resist mean? In the Greek, it means the word is anti. A-N-T-I. Anti, meaning to stand up against of equal value. So it's like standing up against the wall. This is me anti the wall. I'm at the same, same, it's, it's there and I'm here. Whatever you do to me, I'm doing to you. Lucky the wall won't do anything to me so it's hold the roof up so I don't have to do anything to it. But anti means that I will return in kind what you have done to me. So Jesus is saying, don't, don't do nothing. He's saying, don't resist in kind. Not an eye for an eye, not a tooth for a tooth. But instead, when someone slaps you and ridicules you and brings you down a level, offer them the left. Because if you're going to strike me across the left cheek, what have you got to do? Gaz, you better get back up here. I now want you to strike me across the left cheek without doing yourself any damage. That sounds complicated. You, you think I'm less than you? There you go. Okay, so to use the front of his hand now is what he said. What's he said? You're the You're same. You're my equal. He can't use the other hand because if he hits me with the other hand, the back of the other hand, he's saying my actions run clean. But to use the, the, the oh. front, to use the front of the right hand, actually now you've elevated me. I'm no longer less than you. No, you don't have to do it again. It's all right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can practice this later on, you know. Yeah. So can you see there's a lesson in that which we don't understand in English culture in, the, in 2024? But to be struck with the back of the hand is a major insult, one that could, you could be fined four times as much as if you used the front of your hand. 
It brings you down a level. And instead of going, well, I'm just going to slap you back. Because that, now I'm at the same level as you anyway. Is to offer them the left cheek. And say, do you realise what you've just done? I can see what you've just done. You've tried to belittle me and make me less than yourself. I'm going to offer you the left cheek. And now you have a choice. Use your left hand and use the back hand of it and admit that what you're doing is wrong. Strike me with the front of the right hand and bring me up to your level. Or if you thought about it, maybe just back off. Got it? Lesson number two. All about fashion. And if someone wants to see you, sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Uh, we discussed this in Bible st study a couple of weeks ago and John was like, well, I've got a hundred shirts. What does it really matter? <laughs> someone wants to take my shirt, fine, have it. <coughs> and uh, I'll get another one out of the cupboard. Okay, we need to understand the fashion. Not really fashion, I wouldn't think. But, but what it was like to live in that time of, time of history. Yeah. So we've got to think about who Jesus was talking to at this time as well. So if you go back to chapter 4 of Matthew, uh, verse 23, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralysed, and he healed them. And large crowds came from Galilee and the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down and began to teach. So who are the crowds that are following Jesus? You see a guy who's out there and healing the sick and doesn't care what social economics they come from, who's going to be most attracted to Jesus? The needy. The ones who don't have a lot. Okay, so now as you were saying, Annalise, back in those days, um, if you were rich, you might have three or four coats, you might have a couple of tunics, whatever it might be. But if you were poor, you would really have one of each. What's a tunic? A tunic is, it's like a nightgown, I suppose. It is the part that you would wear, it's your underwear. That's what it is. It's a full length gown that goes down to your feet pretty well. It's the bit that's up against your skin. There's nothing between you and your skin other than the tunic. It's what you would wear from day to day. And what's the cloak? It's like a blanket. Usually made of animal fur. Not animal fur, animal hair. Ever worn a jumper with animal hair? I wore this today, not because I'm trying to make fashion sense, but it's the, it's the closest thing to animal hair I've got. And in fact, when I wear it without, with a short sleeve shirt, you can feel it's, it's a little bit itchy. But I mean, this is synthetic. Back in those days, you were wearing animal hair. And if you've ever had a jumper that's animal hair, you've ever had a jumper that's an itchy jumper? They're warm. But it's good to wear something else underneath to stop them creating an itch. Okay, now let's go back to the story. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. So you're being sued. Obviously, you've done something wrong. Eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, equal value. So you've been up against the courts and the guy wants to sue you for your tunic. What does that mean? Okay, I want to go back to uh, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, there's a little story there, a bit more of the law, verse 10. Uh, now this is talking about loans. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10 says, For when you make a loan of any kind to your neighbour, do not go into his house to get what he is offering as a pledge. Stay outside and let the man to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. If the man is poor, 
So have a lot of people we're talking about here. Do not go to sleep with his pledge in your possession. Return his cloak to him by sunset so that he may sleep in it. Then he will also thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Your cloak is just not a jumper. Your cloak is your blanket. Your cloak is your warmth at night. Your cloak is worth a lot more money than your tunic. It's a lot heavier material. It's really what helps you survive at night. I want to sue you. And your tunic is worth whatever it is I want from you. But your cloak is worth so much more. I don't actually want your cloak. I don't actually want your clue tunic. It's like me asking for your undies. I don't want your underwear. I really don't. But I despise you. I don't like you. You've done something against me. I really don't like you. I could ask for a loaf of bread. I could ask for something of equal value. But I know. I know you only have one tunic. And you only have one cloak. And I know what it's like to wear a cloak without a tunic. Like wearing that, that, that hairy jumper without another shirt underneath. And I know that I can't ask for your cloak because one, it's worth too much. And two, I've got to give it back to you every night anyway. So what good is that? But if I really want to get under your skin, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sue you for your tunic. Because I know that by suing you for your tunic, I've pretty well sued you for your cloak as well. I've sued you for your comfort. I've sued you for more than is what what is due to me. But that is my sweet revenge. This is what the people of the day would have understood. By what a cloak is, what a tunic is, and what it would mean to be sued for your tunic. I can't afford to go and buy another one. And so I now have to either wear my tunic and put up with the itching or I don't wear my, I freeze to death. And what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying if someone wants to sue you for your tunic, if they're so little, if they're so nasty, if they're so detestable to you, they want to do that to you, do what they're doing to you without doing it. Because what they're doing is they're, 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 getting rid of your comfort, they're getting rid of your cloak without actually asking for your cloak. So do to them what their intention is. Give them your tunic and give them the cloak as well. Make it known to them that you know their intentions. The interesting part is here that you don't really wear much underneath your tunic or your cloak and therefore you're left bare. Now that's embarrassing. But imagine the scene you'd be setting. And I don't mean this to make the other guy look bad. But to make the other guy understand and let everyone else know the character of what this guy is like. That I am now left here naked because of what this guy is doing to me. Understand that? There is more to it than just losing my shirt. I don't have a second shirt. I can't just wear the jumper. I won't be comfortable. This is not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. This is something more. Story number three, the fascist regimes. So back in the day, uh, Romans ruled the roost. They were the fascist regime. They could do whatever they like pretty well. You'd have Roman soldiers wandering around all the time. They're governing your place. Uh, They bore a heavy load. They would have been big, burly men. But they would have been wearing, like, armour and... You you see some of the shows. Spears and shields and helmets and backpacks and all the gears in the the back behind them. That's a heavy load to bear. They could pull up anyone on the street. Hey, mate, come over here. You're carrying this. And they would load you up. And for a mile, they're only allowed to do it for a mile at a time. They could load you up for a mile and make you carry... Even if they... Even if it wasn't too heavy for them. They'll make you walk a mile carrying their gear because 
I'm a Roman and you're just a scummy Jew. And for a mile, you would carry the load. Well, actually, we see this story as Jesus is going to the, carrying his cross. And who pops up? Simon. The Romans grab him and say, well, guess what? This is now your duty to carry this burden. I'm guessing it was only for a mile or a bit less than a mile. You could be forced to do this. Can you imagine what your mates would be thinking as you're along carrying the Roman gear? You imagine if you're a father in a field with your kids and then your father is dragged away by the Romans to carry a load? It looks weak. It looks demeaning. Can you imagine bearing the load of that weight? You're not a Roman. You're not built like a tank. You're just a, a guy in a paddock doing some work and you have to carry the load for one mile. And then what's Jesus say? Don't just carry it for one mile. Carry it for two. Oh, good grief, God. It was hard enough carrying it for one mile. You want me to carry it for two miles? But let my light shine to all men that can see that God is good. I'll carry it the extra mile. Doesn't really do much, does it? But could you imagine? Can you imagine that there's a Roman there and he asks you to carry it one mile and at the end of the mile he's laughing at you going, ha, 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 I made you carry it for a mile. Then you go, oh, well, actually, I'd like to carry it for a second one. You say, what? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to carry it for a second one. I'll carry, I'll carry it for another mile for you. And doing it with a smile on your face. And look, as we go, how about we talk about your family? And we have a chat. How about I treat you, you the Roman, who is lording it over me and is abusing his power on me, how about I treat you like a human being and realise that you have issues and you have problems and you have kids and you have families and you're away from them and you've got someone lording it over you. Imagine the difference you can make then. Imagine the difference you can make. Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes into verse 42 and then says, Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants you to, wants to borrow from you. And again, we have a habit of taking this out of context. Give to the one who asks. Lend to the one who wants to borrow. Well, that's easy enough. You know, Gary, you, now you've slapped me. Do you want to borrow something? I'm, I'm happy to give it to you. But what's the context? Who are we talking about here? Remember, we're in a, a very tight little spot here. The, these uh, little passages start with, you have heard it was said. And we know the next one's about to start because in verse 43 it says, you have heard that it was said. So whatever is being said in this verse 42 has to relate to what has happened in the last few verses. Who are we talking about? Who does it say to lend to or to give to? To the evil one. To the ones who have done you wrong. Verse 38 says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist a what? An evil person. Do not resist an evil person. So, in verse 42, when it says, Give to the one who th asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. I'm happy to do that for the ones I like, but for the evil person? Oh, really? But what has Jesus done here? He's put you all on the same plane. You are all equal. You are all equal. Those outside the church are all equal. Guess what? You're all made in the image of God. You're all made in his likeness. You're all sinners. You've all turned your back on him. But for the grace of God, we are as destitute as they are. This is ringing so many bells from the beginning of Matthew, chapter 5, from the Beatitudes. We are all on the same plane. You are not better than anybody else. 
So here am I reading these for years and years and years, not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, turn the other cheek, because if I turn the other cheek, I will be better than the other person. That is not what Jesus is getting at. He doesn't want you to be better than the other person. He wants you to see the other person as a human being, as a creation of his, as one loved by him, and to treat them as such. It is so easy for us as human beings to be belittled by somebody else. And what do we do in return? We belittle them. Maybe not physically. I don't slap the other person with the back of my hand. But in my mind I have belittled them. You're not as worthy as I am. You're an evil person. You don't deserve the grace of God like I do. I... I can just do nothing and walk away and be the better person, and, but I leave you in the grime and in the scum of where you are. But Jesus doesn't want you to leave people in the grime and scum of where they are. He wants you to share with them the goodness of God that they might see the errors of their ways. He doesn't want you to belt it down their throats, preach it to them. He wants you to show it to them. See, what what Jesus is asking for you to do here is to think less of yourself and what is due to me and think more of the other person who is doing the thing that which is really getting on your nerve and point them to Jesus. The other way I've always read it, it's all about me. It's all about me making a good show. It's all about me doing things for God. And if I go back to Matthew chapter Matthew 5, verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. It doesn't say, in the same way, shine your light before men. Let your light shine. It is a natural reaction. Know that if you follow in the footsteps of Jesus, if you love your neighbour as you love yourself, if you see other people as built in the image of God just as you are, if you realise that you are just as destitute in your own sin as they are, except for Jesus, your actions will automatically display the goodness of God. Your actions will automatically be a light to the nation. Otherwise, all I'm showing them, I'm just trying to tell you how good a person I am because of what God has done for me. You don't have to force it. Let it shine. Let it shine. It's a change of attitude, not a change of action. You can change your actions and not change your attitude. You can try and do the right things. And this is where the Pharisees went wrong with the law. They were trying to do the right things, but with the wrong attitude. They're trying to do do the right things in order to buy their way into heaven, in order to be good enough to get to heaven, to be good enough to be right in the eyes of God. But their attitude hadn't changed because their hearts haven't changed. It is our hearts that need changing, that our attitudes may change towards those people around us, that we might love Not just our neighbour, but our enemies. But I'm not going to go too far there this week because that's next week. I don't know about you, but rereading those three little stories has made a massive change to my life. A massive change to my understanding. It's ripped the excuses out from under my feet. It's telling me to stop being weak. It's stop... Not to write people off, but to love them as Jesus loves me. Let's pray. Father, you have a lot of work to do in me. Father, even though I can see the errors of my way, I am so slow in changing them. I'm so, so wanting to change them myself. But Father, I pray that you will do your work in me. 
that you will change my heart. That I might see those around me through your eyes. Those who offend me, those who belittle me. Father, those who I offend and those who I belittle. Father, may my light shine, not because of what I do, but because of who you are in me, changing me. May this story not be about me. May it be about you and your kingdom. And once the change occurs in me, then we will see a change in this world. Father, thank you for your forgiveness to me, to each of us. Father, may we be truly lights on the hill, that when people see our deeds, our good deeds, because of what you have done in us, that their praise won't come to me, but that it will come to you. Thank you, Father, for your patience and your kindness and your love. And I pray these through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.